you know, the reason they, they like reading my stuff is that I've always got real life examples to prove what I'm saying. There's a lot of good people that listen to this podcast. You know, other than God and my family, deer hunting would be next in line on my list of priorities. From the bottom of our hearts, it's it's just fantastic and awesome to uh, to have the support that you guys are getting. People ask me about expandable broadheads and love swings. <laughs> Chasing Giants with Don Higgins and Terry Peer. Brought to you by Osseo Camo, nature's most lethal camouflage. Follow along as Don and Terry discuss the techniques, strategies, and dedication needed to harvest one of God's most amazing creations, world-class whitetails. Well, welcome everyone to the Chasing Giants podcast brought to you by Osseo Gear. Don Higgins, I'm Terry Peer. This is episode 148 that's going to air on December 18th. Don, it's almost Christmas. You've been on the consulting and seminar trail. This season has just flown by, and while we're teeing this thing up, another record-setting downloads for the podcast this week. This was a big week for us. Yeah, it just keeps growing, and uh, you know, I guess it's just from uh, listeners telling their friends, because I don't know what else is doing it. We're not doing anything different. Um, well, tell us a little bit about, tell us a little bit about this event that you spoke at up in Michigan. And I think you did some consulting visits while you're on the road. Let's catch up a little bit with what you did this week. Yeah. I, uh, went to Michigan, uh, left Thursday. I had a, oh, I had a speaking engagement, uh, Friday night and Nathan Byler, one of our real world dealers, well, he was a dealer and then he moved, uh, to a new uh, neighborhood about an hour and a half away from his old home. And um, is no longer in the archery shop business, but, uh, Nathan, uh, has become a real good friend and he was uh, needing a speaker for, a uh, basically a fundraising event for an Amish school and asked me to come up. And since I had to go do a consulting visit or two, uh, I went and did that last night, I had a fantastic crowd, probably, uh, I think they said about 400 people, give or take, um, came in, had a, had a fantastic crowd, but had something happen that I've never had happen before. Uh-oh, I haven't heard wow. this one yet. Yeah, my laptop with my PowerPoint presentation <laughs> froze up and I mean I could not get it to do anything. I tried you restarting had to wing it. Before. I had to wing it and it became a question and answer session, right? Pretty darn quick. <laughs> and uh the crowd was great though. They just kept firing away the questions and it went on so long. I, I bet I was up there two hours. At least it seemed like it. Um, but, uh, man, they fa- they had some fantastic food, too. I mean, after that thing was over, I ate two plates full of food, and they sent me home with a gift basket full of goodies, and they just treated me like royalty, and I'm, I'm just uh, so grateful for those folks and uh, Nathan and his friendship, and um appreciate everybody coming out to that event. It sounds like a success with that many people, but it doesn't surprise me. I think that's part of the popularity of this podcast is we talk about what the listeners want to talk about. And we started doing that a lot when we do live podcasts or uh, events. We we more open it up into the audience so it's not death by PowerPoint and uh, let the audience lead the discussion. So that doesn't surprise me that they like that, but I feel for you. I've had my PowerPoint go bad before, and you, you talk about feeling like you're on an island. Well, I'll tell you what, the, the crowd loved it too, because they hit me with everything from mechanical broadheads to, I mean, you, you name it, they, they was throwing it out there and we had some good laughs too. But you know what? One of the, the question that I get the most when I'm out on the road is where's Terry? <laughs> How come Terry's not with you? Where's Terry? Mm-hmm. How's Terry doing? Everybody wants to know about Terry. You're a celebrity, whether you want to admit it or not. <laughs> I'm not admitting that. There's uh, there is no place in the industry for me. I can assure you, people of it. I'm just You're like everybody. I, I'm just like everybody <laughs> else. So let's talk a little bit about we had we had a, a huge downloads of the podcast this week. And to be honest with you, both of us probably are a little surprised by that because we thought we would probably be banned. <laughs> Uh, yeah. but, but overall, I think the demographic of, uh, of our listeners and what, uh, people believe in that, that listen to us, we don't appeal to everybody, but I think nobody's going to be too surprised about us and where we draw our lines at, are they? No. And, and I'll tell you, I was, I was shocked at, uh, 
how few negative comments that we we heard i thought we'd hear way more negative than what we did lots and lots and lots of positive comments um, which we're really grateful for and I, I think you know everybody that we was going to offend we already offended and ran them off so we all we got left is supporters and that just seems to be growing but uh you know the the, the one comment that kind of stuck to me was some guy called us a hate group he didn't know he was joining or listening to a hate group and boy that kind of struck a nerve with me and i had plenty of time on the road to think about that you know in the last couple of days and i don't we're not a hate group whatsoever we're a truth group we speak the truth and some people hate the truth and uh you know i we don't set out to offend people but the truth does offend some people and you know i'm it's too bad that 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 person feels that way, but they're entitled to their opinion just as we are. Well, I think the the biblical principles behind what we talk about, uh, we're going to stand firm to that. We don't hate people. Uh, we don't dislike people, but we dislike sin. And, you know, part of, part of our um, platform that I asked you from the very beginning is, are we going to stand firm in our faith and openly talk about it? And you said, absolutely. And we're going to continue to hold, from, but to say that we're hating on someone, no, not at all. Um, I, I pray and hope that uh, the people that um, that need it will find the Lord, and if I can help facilitate that with any of them, um, I'll be first in line. But you know, Don, you got you got some really pointed questions asked of you this week. You know, are you a racist? You know, are you a hate group? But there's there's one really serious question that I think people really want to know from Don Higgins. What's that? Is when you have spilt Smokey's deer lure on your finger while applying it on a rope scrape, have you smelled your finger afterwards? <laughs> what doesn't everybody? I'm just human. <laughs> I'm as human as everybody else. <laughs> every time you every time you open the bottle, you got to take a whiff. And I think, it, <laughs> I think it smells good. You put a little but, behind, put a little behind your ears for that fancy dinner when you go out and take Robin out on the town. Well, she thinks I'm nuts anyway because I like the smell of cow manure, and I think cow manure smells good. It just smells like the country to me, and it doesn't stink. Now hog manure stinks, but but cows, as long as it's not too strong, you don't want to be in a barn, you know, cleaning out a barn, but. The smell of fresh cow manure is like the smell of fresh cut hay. It's just one of those country <laughs> smells that doesn't bother me whatsoever. Well, I think it all stinks, but I agree with you that hog and chicken manure are about the two worst. So, yeah. Well, we got a great show. We got some good dialogue of different things to talk about. We're going to uh, change the order up a little bit because we have a lot of questions that we want to try to. We're getting so many questions. Even though it might cost us an extra t-shirt to buy every week, we want to try to get through those as much as we can, but not make the podcast too long. And we're going to do a segment today where I'm going to pick your brain about uh, some conversation that's popped up about deer uh, and specifically bucks shedding their antlers early this year. I started seeing a few comments of this on social media and I actually got a picture of a buck that broke it off. I intentionally posted a picture where it looked like it was shed and a picture that looked like it was broken just to create and see what kind of feedback I would get. Uh, the buck that I posted was, uh, it was broken, but I want to pick your brain later in the podcast about uh, why bucks may shed their antlers early, anything that you've heard and, and dive into that a little bit. We're going to break into that segment a little bit later. Anything specific that broke out with your consulting clients in uh, Michigan and uh, in Illinois? Because I had dinner with Wes Delks and he had a, he had an interesting finding I want to share. Well, you know, I, the thing that just blows me away day after day after day on a consulting trail is how awesome these people are that I meet with. I mean, they just absolutely treat me fantastic and they're open to the ideas I'm throwing out there. Today, I met with a, a gentleman and his son in Michigan. They looked at two different properties, the father's property and the son's down the road a few miles. And, uh, you know, it, it surprised. I, I threw out some ideas that I, I didn't really expect them to accept as well as they did and they didn't not only accept it they was all in and, and i think these guys are going to grow 
some really good deer in Michigan because they are so willing to do what it's going to, what it's going to be required to make it happen. And you don't always see that with consulting clients. Some of them tie your hands a little bit because they've got other things going on. And I totally understand that. I'm not, I don't mean it in a negative way, but you know, some people need their, their ag fields on their property for farm for income to help make the payment. And some people just turn you loose and say, you do what you want with every acre that I own. I just want it to be the best deer piece. And that's what I ran into today was just, if you throw it all out there, we're, we're all in, just let us have it. And, uh, that, that was the big takeaway you know, from this week. What, how many, uh, are you full right now or you still got a couple openings that you have available if somebody's uh-huh. interested? Well, it's like this, Terry. I, I had a number that I wanted to do this winter and I'm already at one and a half times that number. Now, that doesn't mean if the right situation comes along, I mean, I'm not going to make a special trip to a state where I don't have any other work, but you know, if there's somebody that wants me to do one and I'm going to be in that area anyway, or it's close to home, then yeah, I, I would work in a few more, but, uh, if I don't work in anymore, I'm not going to be disappointed either. Cause I I've got more than I want already, but you, you know, I'm, I'm doing way less than I've done the last two winters. Right. Well, I had uh West Delks was traveling from down in like Western Kentucky up into Ohio. So he was driving very close to my house, uh, I believe Thursday night, if I'm not mistaken this week. And I met him for a late dinner and, you know, since he's not the GM working at Real World every week, he's got extra time. So uh, he said that he is uh, have a lot booked, but he still does have openings. I had a scheduled engagement that I needed to do in late February that has been canceled. So I might have an opportunity for the right uh, situation to pick up maybe two or three more if they're in the right spot. I'm not going to travel, but I know also our other two. Um, um, uh, consultants have openings also, but the quicker you get a hold of one of us and you can start with Don and uh, he can kind of filter them out if if um, it starts with that. But let us know as soon as possible so we can start planning it. I know all of us, even though we're dabbling in it right now, starting first of the year, January and February, it's all go. That's where we do most of it so we can get out of the woods before green up and allow you to do your timber projects. So make sure that happens. Uh, Wes told me an unbelievable story this week that you'll really appreciate, Don. He said that he had done a uh, com, uh, a consulting visit with uh, this family. They just treated him super. Um, like you said, it's just great people that we meet. But I guess Wes got out of the truck and had one of the most unbelievable code brown pains that you could ever imagine. <laughs> and in, instead of going and finding a tree somewhere he actually accepted the invite to go in this family's house and use their restroom. And he went in there and absolutely just destroyed this bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> He's he going to appreciate it. You tell this story. Hey, I, I got permission to tell this story. It's so good. Even he said that I could share it, but he, he absolutely destroyed this bathroom of his of his consulting client his customer he's in their bathroom just destroyed it well he goes and looks start looking around there's no toilet paper there's no toilet paper anywhere in the bathroom not under the sink not behind the toilet (laughs) and he said he said there was no way that he was going to be able to make it out because he had made such a mess so this young innovative whitetail consultant that you call the prodigy (laughs) decided to take his boot off and cut the the toe end half of his sock off (laughs) he he cut so like halfway out his foot out to his toes he takes his pocket knife and cuts off the end of his sock (laughs) and wipes his urine with the end of his sock and then hides it in their trash can puts his boot back on and does consulting work the rest of the day with just a sock over his heel. So, uh, I think, I think the prodigy was pretty ingenious when it came to, 
<laughs> well, he told me a Code Brown story too, but it, it's not as good as that one. But oh. he, he had a Code Brown pain hit him in the woods when he was walking around with these clients. Yeah, and he didn't want to. He didn't want to tell them that he had to go drop a load. You know. <laughs> he, <laughs> <and> he, <laughs> He, t- he tells him, he said, just wait right here. I need to go over here and check something out. <laughs> now, come on. You're in the woods. You, you've hired a whitetail consultant. You're in the woods. And he tells you in your own, you're in your own woods. And this guy says, wait right here. I need to go check something out. What does he know about their woods that he needs to go check out? <laughs> I don't think he pulled the wool over their eyes whatsoever. They knew what he was doing. Come oh, on. Oh, absolutely. Wes. But he I also ate better than that. He also ate four four full sushi rolls by himself. So if he's eating like that or that, uh, what's that one restaurant he liked up in Illinois? Well, Naf Naf, Foo Foo or something. I don't yeah, know. Naf Naf or Indian over. food. So yeah. I think he's gonna have to stick with uh, beef jerky and cheese if he doesn't want that to happen again. So, uh, but no, I had a really good visit with Wes. Just uh, <laughs> so proud of him and his wife. As they're starting their family, he's working his tail off, but um, I'm sure he is going to pack toilet paper from now on, not have to, not have to use the other end of his sock. Well, I hope if anybody's listening and you've got Wes on the schedule to look at your property this year, <laughs> please, please hand him a roll of toilet paper the, as soon as he shows up and gets out of his truck. <laughs> And if he asks to go look at an area of his of your farm by himself, make sure you're you're uh, secretly Not following downwind. him with your cell phone out to get a picture for us to use on the podcast. So, but don't be downwind. <laughs> All right. Well, let's take a quick break and listen to our friends from Osseo Gear. This podcast is going to publish on December eighteenth, and today is the last day for those of you listening on Sunday. Today is the last day to get a uh, savings of 20% using coupon code Higgins gift. That's H I G G I N S G I F T to get 20% off. This sale expires uh, December 18th at 1159 Eastern time. Osseo gear introduces a premium line of bow hunting gear that is unmatched. Pairing nature's finest camouflage with the best technological innovations, Osseo Gear brings whitetail bow hunters the gear they need to be the best at their craft. The unique camouflage mimics the intricate feather pattern of North America's greatest predatorial creatures. Designed for invisibility, built for comfort, and engineered for function. Visit OsseoGear.com. That's A-S-I-O Gear.com to start shopping. Osseo Gear. Prepare to be invisible. All right, Don. Uh, thanks to our friends from Osseo and Joe Miles for uh, supporting this podcast um, and for Wes for giving us some laughs. That's pretty funny. Well, we always need some entertainment around here. And, you know, talking, uh, speaking of uh, consulting, one thing I want to throw out on a serious note is that uh, with the Whitetail Master Academy, we're giving away uh, gifts 12 days before Christmas. So we've already started and we're going through Christmas Eve. The grand prize is, which will be drawn on Christmas Eve, is a free consulting visit by me. And Steve Shields is going to come along on the trip. We're going to video the winner's property, the whole process, what I recommend, just like we do the other properties on the Whitetail Master Academy. So it's not too late to get in on that drawing if you're hearing this before Christmas Eve. Um, each day, um, if you've signed up, you're eligible for every one of those drawings for 12 days. Uh, a couple other gifts that are going to be in the, uh, on the list is, uh, I've given away some of my books, uh, whitetail icons books that'll be autographed. I'm giving away two free admissions to the whitetail masterclass on my farm and our title sponsor, uh, Osseo gear, uh, Joe miles has donated a complete set of camouflage for the winner. So, uh, Whoever wins will be getting a hold of you to get your sizes and everything. And uh, Joe's going to take care of you with a free set of Osseo. So you got to be a member of the Whitetail Master Academy uh, to be eligible. So just go to whitetailmasteracademy.com and you can sign up there. All right. Sounds great. Well, make sure you guys stay tuned to the podcast later on when we talk about uh, bucks dropping and shedding their antlers early. 
But to try to get through as many of these questions and uh, talk about the things that you listeners want to talk about more, let's go ahead and put our first question up on the screen and let you dive into that, Don. Okay, and we're going to try to move through these a little bit quicker than we typically do just because we got so many, and you guys keep sending them in because I've got plenty of good ones to pick from. Um, this one's uh, from Anonymous Farmville, USA. He says, Don, do you believe there is such as a thing as an off year on a property? On my home farm, I've turned it into what most would call a whitetail paradise. Large bedding areas of woods and real-world switchgrass, timber work, woody browse projects. Most of the property is left alone as a sanctuary. As for food, I've got standing beans, corn, deadly dozen, clover, you name it. Hunting pressure is almost none, and it's only hunted when the wind is right. This year was off, way off. Had a couple of good bucks move through, but none wanted to stay. Instead, they moved to neighboring property that isn't managed and is hunted poorly. Thought they'd move back, but they have not. Several were shot. Do you think it's an off year, or am I missing something? Feels like the more work I put into the into it, the poorer the hunting gets on this one piece. Merry Christmas and blessings to both you and Terry. Well, you know... There is situations um, where, for whatever reasons, deer do things that are just unexplainable. And I can think of one situation uh, with a buck that uh, I was chasing several years back. This buck would summer in a bachelor group on a property on private land um, on a small property. And he was there every year until right about the time he shed velvet. I'd get a couple pictures of him in hard horn, but that was it. And then he'd be gone. And I never could figure out where that buck went. Well, it just so happened when he was seven and a half years old, a friend of mine shot that buck about a mile and a half to two miles away on public land. And it was the craziest thing. I, I could never understand why that buck chose to spend his summer on private ground where there was hardly any human intrusion whatsoever. In fact, I think I was the only one on that property during the summer. Um, and, and yet in the fall, when hunting pressure was at his highest, that buck would, would travel almost two miles to spend his time on public hunting land made absolutely no sense whatsoever to me when he had a much better place. If he'd have just stayed on his summer pattern, he'd have been way safer. And sometimes deer do things that we just can't explain and, and you, you can't predict them either. And as far as a property having an off year, um, you know, I, I don't know is that the property itself has an off year. I think, uh, you know, sometimes like on my property, there'll be years where there's not a buck that I consider a shooter. And I think what happens is the bucks that would have been shooters that year get killed somewhere else. Um, you know, I've explained many times my uh, management approach with bucks of shooting the poorer bucks in each age class when they're young and allowing the better ones in each age class to move to the older age classes well sometimes those better ones in each age class get shot as two and three year olds on other surrounding properties and uh, you know my management approach just is um, not valid I, I guess you would say for that age class of buck it, and it's, so it's not the property's fault um, the property is still doing everything um, that it does any other year. It, it's just that through bad luck, circumstances, whatever, uh, the bucks that I wanted to live get killed sooner than I uh, had anticipated or wanted them to. One comment about the uh, the question and then a follow-up question to you. I don't want to drag this out. Like you said, we got a lot to talk about. But even though this uh, contributor is anonymous, we know the guy very well, and he has the he has the opportunity to probably be one of the best whitetail minds in the industry on down the road. And uh, I don't think in this case he needs to overthink it, but just stay the course. I think things are going to come together, and uh, you know patience is key when developing a property. And just keep doing what you're doing. Um, but as a follow up question to this, I've heard this several times that my property is only an early season spot or my, my property is only a late season spot and I can't do anything to change that. Do you buy into that? I mean, can you really take a property 
and really change the whole dynamic over time to make it be different than what it is? Or is that property always going to have the bookends that it is, that it's always going to appeal an early season or just a late season spot? Well, I hesitate to give a definite answer, yes or no, because I think it varies with the property. But I know on, in some circumstances, you absolutely can change the property because that's what I've done with my property. Now, it's going to take some um, extreme management practices to do it but uh you absolutely can do it and most of the time it's going to be providing the ingredient that's in the that's the weakest link in your area be it food or cover and you know in the summertime you may, maybe you've got a a property where the bucks are there early and, and then they leave well maybe it's because of the cover you have or the uh pressure that's put on that cover maybe that's why i'm not saying that is every time it definitely is not every time but maybe that's the situation um and maybe it's the food um you know i think we we get just like you said terry i think sometimes we overthink it and uh we try too hard and i know that's the case uh with hunting these big bucks and i think it's when it comes to managing a property i think it's the same um, there, there's some basic principles and if you follow them, you don't need to overthink it in, uh, you know, a lot of the things I criticize that I see on the internet or whatever it, it is really ideas or principles where somebody is overthinking the whole thing and they're making a, a whole lot harder and more complicated than it really is. Well, I just, I think that we have these expectations, whether it's a, consulting client that we have, even though, you know, I, I got to go over to Todd Covey's property last Sunday and um, Jay Gingrich was over there planting about a hundred trees for, for Todd. So I went over to say hi to Jay and I, I wouldn't call what I did help. I may, basically stood around, took pictures most of the time, but you know, even him, he did, he did a project with you last year and still implemented it. And he's seeing more deer than he's ever seen because of the lack of intrusion. But to truly get benefit of, of a total plan, it takes years. And it's really hard for any of us to have the patience to say, why didn't the flips uh, or the switch get flipped today? Um, why, didn't, why didn't I change this approach and now all of a sudden? And the thought that just comes to mind is when we're talking about attracting late season bucks. And one of your ideas is that these bucks that miraculously appear in the middle of winter when the weather's really bad are bucks that were born on that property. I mean, that's that's a five, six, seven year delta just between when they're born to where you would see those mature bucks coming back when the weather is, is really bad. So I think that people try to overcomplicate it, but I think we're also very impatient some, and I'm not implying that we'll call him John for lack of better term. That's code name, especially for his preferred brand of tractor. But if, if we're calling, uh, if John's, I'm not saying John's being impatient. I just think sometimes all of us overthink it and we get too impatient. I agree hundred percent. All right, well, let's take a quick uh, break. Uh, we got a really good segment with two properties from our friends at Buy a Farm. Let's go ahead and get that done, and then we'll come back with the second question. Buyafarm.com is your source for farm, recreational properties, rural homes, and more. Now, here is Don Higgins with this week's featured property. Well, welcome to this week's Buy a Farm segment. I'm honored to have Don Bailey, managing broker from buyafarm.com on the on the podcast tonight. Don, you're with us tonight to talk about an online auction for a property in White County, Illinois that looks fabulous for a deer hunter. Yes, uh, it's uh, White County, Illinois. It's 198 acres, and we're going to offer it two tracks. 40 acres of it is totally wooded. And then the other part of the track has about 105 acres tillable. We're going to offer it multi-par. Uh, you can buy just the 40 or you can buy the remainder. Uh, it's near Crossville, Illinois, uh, in White County, pretty close to the Indiana line, Terry. Mm -hmm. uh, every time I go down there, uh, 
see just an abundant amount of deer sign, and I witnessed several turkeys on the property. Yep. Uh, it uh, has a good income on it, uh, of course, on the uh, tillable part. Right. And uh, make somebody a fantastic place, Terry, for hunting with income. Uh, it, it, it's, it's speech for itself, like a lot of our properties do. Well, the thing I like about properties like this that you guys bring to the table is, you know, we get a ton of messages about people leasing hunting property. And the the problem with leasing property is you're just dumping thousands and thousands of dollars into basically a trespass fee every year to be able to hunt. Properties like this, if you can figure out a way to finance the deal, whether it's a group of guys going in, there's enough income on it to pay for itself. And what I like about this property, um, even it, it's an in, online auction, but whether you're looking for a small track of all woods to just hunt on, or you're looking at, you know, the bigger picture of some tillable, you could go in and possibly buy this and basically have the cropland help pay for the property over time. Yes, that's exactly right. The farmer... <clears throat> that leases the farmland also uh, gives them a little bit for the hunting rights. So he's basically the only one that's that's been hunting it. Uh, and it it it's one of them properties, Terry, that you just need to go look at. I mean, I'm gonna have tons. Of, there's tons of pictures on the website. Uh, I'm going to take some pictures with my helicopter when the weather clears up. But it's one of them properties that you really just need to see to appreciate how how good it is yep so the thing i like about this is it has a creek that goes through even the big track of tillable so it's going to hold a lot of deer you zoom out on the aerial photograph and it's kind of like this pocket of woods out in the middle of open ag country which we love that because you know the neighbors can't necessarily set the property line and hunt it uh, the other thing I like about it is access. Um, if you were to buy both tracks together, you have a lot of access from different county roads for different wind directions. And I just think for somebody who's looking for either a small track or a bigger track, this online auction would be a very good opportunity to start with a clean slate and uh, either get a small track or a bigger track that you could generate revenue on to help pay for the property. Um, I'm looking at it. looks like some mature trees on it. looks like a big funnel island out in the middle of open ag country. It kind of has all of everything and I think could make a, um, somebody's outdoor or recreational property dream come true. Yes, I, I, I totally agree. And on this property, Terry, uh, we have a new agent, uh, Yale Epler, uh, and he's, lives in indiana uh he's a, a commercial appraiser he does farmland mm -hmm. uh, he's been around it for years and years but so you need to call him or call me on this property okay so i'm looking at the website now and on the people watching on youtube are going to be seeing some pictures of this property the bidding closes um on february 15th so we have a little bit of time to really research this, make arrangements to go view the property in person. Uh, you mentioned it's it's uh, southeast of Crossville, Illinois. And, you know, we have a lot of Amish listeners that listen to this too. This could be a really nice homestead for Amish, Amish or Mennonite families that are listening on MTech. Um, if they need to get a hold of you guys and try to figure out uh, what the best way to go about either watch or looking at this property or bidding on this property, how can they or anyone else that has questions get a hold of you guys? Uh, just call me direct, Don Bailey, at 618-919-1031 or dbailey at biofarm.com or call Yale Epler uh, at 812 812- Four eight zero four seven two two. It's Yepler L E P L E R at biofarm dot com. Yeah, I, I'm. I, I really like the fact that this auction is a little bit further out. You know, a lot of times we're we're talking about properties that are actually an open bid at the time we release it. In this case, you got plenty of time. The bidding doesn't start until Wednesday, February first, two thousand twenty three. And the auction closes on Wednesday, February 15th. So you have plenty of time to make arrangements to go out 
and look at this property with Don Bailey or uh, Yale Epler um, in White County, Illinois. So, Don, we appreciate the support of the podcast. Is there Before we close out, is there anything else that you want to talk about on this property? Because I think this could be somebody's dream come true here. No, it, it's it's a salesman's a salesman, but most of the time properties sell themselves, Terry. And, and this, this one is. This one's, this one's a unique property for sure. Yeah, I agree. So it looks really good from the aerials. Um, I hope that um, the, the landowner that gets it, that trusted by a farm to broker the property is – is going to be pleased with the amount of business that you guys you guys are a class act and uh, handle all of these online auctions or listings in such a professional manner. So if you're interested in this property or any other properties for rec- recreational or agriculture, please give Don Bailey a call or visit the biofarm.com uh, website or social media post. We appreciate your help, Don. All right, Don, well, I have the second question of the night up on our screen. I'll turn it over to you and let you go ahead and read it. Uh, This one comes from Paul Whitworth from Wadsworth, Illinois. He says, greetings, Don and Terry. Season is still going and hoping to get some late season action in, but it is hard not to think about the upcoming spring season and food plot work. You posted some interesting photos of some ears of corn back in October. When can we expect some announcements regarding new real world spring seed offerings, if any? Also, how did your pumpkin hills work out late last year? Thank you for your time, Paul. Brittany Griner, 2024. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> now, there you go. There's a guy with a sense of humor. We need yep. more of them. Yep. Um, uh, Paul, the uh, our new land management guides are expected uh, to be in between Christmas and New Year's. And uh, in regards to the Nutri-Crave corn that you mentioned, uh, there will be some information in there about that. Um I don't know if we're quite ready to spill the beans on what we got with coming with the corn this year, but one thing about the Nutri-Crave uh, this year, it's going to be offered in 80,000 kernel bags, just like, uh, you know, your traditional ag seed corn is. So uh, for those folks that uh, want to plant several acres, you don't have to buy a bunch of one acre bags. You can buy the same size bag you would buy any seed corn in and uh, save a little money over those one acre bags uh, so that's something to look forward to um I, I will say that uh in the line of in the corn line we do have some some pretty big news uh coming down uh, uh the road and we're still working out some details is why i don't want to say too much too soon but uh i think when you see the land management guide it's going to kind of give it away anyway but uh a uh, couple details to work out there um well, we can go ahead. Um, we can go ahead and talk about soil charge coming out of a pilot program. Uh, the feedback that we heard from soil charge was phenomenal with the blend that we chose, not only with tissue analysis, browse pressure. The thing that we did change, though, and I'm I'm sure there's going to be people that'll comment on this, but how effective this product is going to be is going to depend on how much you put down it when it relates to uh, weed control. So you could put this product down at 40, 45 pounds per acre, and it would still feed the deer and do some good things for your soil. But the total package of what Dwayne Hopkins has really put inside of this bag is is it has more fingers to it than anything else that's on the market. And that is provide an early food source because this product can be frost seeded. That's very unique to this product is because we can frost seed it. The second thing is it provides an early green up um, plant that's not only going to attract for you turkey hunters, but also give the deer something early to browse on. But the third thing, other than building your soil and building nitrogen, is to keep that weed pressure down. So one of the things that you're going to see in that is the acreage recommendation that we put on there. It's going to be a little bit different than other things on the market, but that's the reason behind it. But that product is fully out of a pilot program. And then the other thing we can go ahead and talk about is the Southern blend that we put out for a pilot program this year. We have we have named that now instead of uh, uh, Southern blend. It's called Dixie Dozen. And so we have a deadly dozen for the further north, a Dixie Dozen for the Southern blend um, that just was phenomenal everywhere we tested it. 
And I was kind of more on the farthest north end of where uh, we had people testing it at. And those deer just absolutely hammered. I've been really impressed with that. And we'll be planting it again on my farm. Mm -hmm. We might also mention that uh, Miscantha sales opened up this week. So pre-orders for Miscanthus, you can now go to the Real World website and order them. And I know a bunch of people have done it because I checked my emails when I got home and I was absolutely blown away with how many emails. I get an email every time an order comes through and uh, I had over 200. <laughs> so, Well, the, the other part of the question that Paul asked you was an update on your pumpkin uh, hills. Oh, yeah. And we you, you gave an update about that on the podcast before, but we have so many new listeners uh, just take a couple minutes and back up and sit, kind of explain what you were trying to do and then what happened. Well, yeah, I, my uh, NutriCrave corn came up and there were some areas where the corn wasn't super thick where uh, oh, we had a dry spell right after I planted for about 30 days. And there was some uh, like clay knobs in, in my plot where the corn stand was not as good as it was in other places. And so I went in there and uh, I planted some hills of pumpkins. Um, they did not do so well. And I think the reason for it was the re residual herbicide that I put down um, for the corn. Now I brought in buckets of fresh dirt to create the hills to put the pumpkin seeds in. So they did start to grow. But I think once those roots got down into that soil that had been exposed to the herbicide, it's almost like uh they stopped growing and uh i to my not i mean i haven't walked every row of that corn plot it's about three acres but i have not seen the first pumpkin so uh next year i'm going to try something a little bit different and uh, trying to get those pumpkins going in my corn plots okay Hey, Spinks from Quiet Cat here in our virtual showroom space where you can connect with a product expert and learn all about our bikes, our accessories, and what makes Quiet Cat the leader in off-road electric bikes. Schedule a live session today by clicking in the link below or going to quietcat.com slash meet. The next one comes from Chris Smith from Amory, Wisconsin. He says, Don and Terry, keep up the good work with the show. Look forward to every episode. How can I create screening to get into my bow stands without generating bedding areas? I use topography as much as possible, but some areas need treetops, grass, and other vegetation. My concern is that I now created another strip of bedding area that I will 100% of the time bump anything that is there up on entry. Is there anything structurally that differentiates screening versus cover or is it how I hunt? Is it a how I hunt problem and need to change the, the frame time frame of hunting those stands where the deer are normally off the beds? Uh, Chris, great question. Um, without a doubt, the best screening cover you can plant is Miscanthus. It's better than even trees, conifer trees, cedars, pines, whatever. And the reason it makes such a great screen is you only need about three or four rows and those rows are spaced only about 18 inches apart. So you're planning and they're going to, they're going to spread just a little bit, but you're not creating a screen that's 20 yards wide. You're creating a screen that's about maybe 10 feet wide at the most. And that, that strip is going to be so narrow that deer aren't going to bet in it uh, or it'd be very rare for them to bet in it. In, in fact, sometimes you can probably get by, well, I'm, if on the edge of a switchgrass plot, you could probably get by with two rows because the switchgrass is going to provide some screening too. Straight switchgrass or straight miscanthus, you're going to want to use a minimum of three rows, but it's going to be so narrow and so dense that the screening is going to be fabulous, but it's going to be in such a narrow area that the deer are not going to bed in it. I get this question probably it's probably in the top five questions that I get when answering uh, messages for real world. And I don't know why, I don't know why people um, 
are so hesitant about it because I don't believe everybody hears all the garbage that says it's invasive or whatever. Um, if I had to guess, I think that they're worried about the labor or time it takes to plant rhizomes versus just run a, a drill across a piece of property or a section to, to plant switchgrass instead. And, you know, the problem with it is even when you have the best switchgrass, you still have to plant that a 20 yard strip because on the edges it's going to be a little bit thinner even your best switchgrass on your property uh take for instance when Smokey walked out right when you shot him in the last five feet of that of that switchgrass field you could actually see him he got he got yeah. in 10 feet you couldn't see him at all and to get a screen you're going to have to go wider which means you're going to hold deer and if you're walking along that you're going to bump deer so um, I, I think it's just the fear that people have of planting these rhizomes and there's no hiding around it. It's going to be a little bit of work, but it, once you do it, once you're done, uh, never have yep. to worry about it again. So it's mm -hmm. no pain, no gain, I guess, in this case. Right. All right. Good question, Chris. We get that one a lot. Let's move on to the next one. We're going to breeze through these pretty quick. Next one comes from Bryce Bolin from Andale, Kansas. He says, hello, Don and Terry. First off, thank you for putting out a quality product, both through Real World Wildlife and the Chasing Giants podcast. And more importantly, thank you for your convictions in Christ and making it a primary piece of your products and message. My question is for Don. Don, I was recently blessed and lucky enough to harvest an eight and a half year old bruiser of a deer. As you know, the attributes of a buck of that age, quality is spectacular, even compared to a five and a half year old. Being a bit in all, my buddy and I discussed the question. In today's hunting environment, what is more rare? Harvesting a quality eight and a half year old buck or a 200 inch buck? What is your opinion and why? Um, so the question is, what is more rare, a quality eight and a half year old deer? or a 200 inch buck. And I would, I would put them about equal. Um, now, if you just said what is more rare an eight and a half year old or a 200 inch buck, I, I think the 200 inch buck is rarer than the eight and a half year old buck. But, uh, when you throw the word quality in there, that brings it up to, to about equal. And, uh, there's no sense dragging this question on or this answer on. That's my opinion. Yeah, as, as uh, hunting pressure in, increases, um, it's harder and harder to get and find mature deer, much less 200-inch mature deer. Do you think that people uh, miss, especially in areas that don't shoot a lot of does, do you think people don't realize how old does get? Because, man, it just seems like there's some old nanny does on some of these properties that know every stick that's been laying on the forest floor for for 10 years. I think people misunderstand how long some of these does can live. No, no doubt about it. And, and there's more old does out there than there are old bucks. And uh, I would be willing to bet there's more does that are 10 years old than there are bucks that are seven years old. Wow. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. Yep. But well, there's right. more does to begin with. And sure. there's got to be more old ones. Okay. This one's from Justin Ray from Lucas, Kentucky. He says, Don and Terry, hello, I'm Justin Ray from Lucas, Kentucky. I believe my question will be more for Terry. I'm a newer Kentucky hunter, previously from Illinois. My questions will be on supplemental feeding and minerals. This is new to me coming from a state that doesn't allow it. Is it best to pour the feed on the ground or use a feeder? If a feeder, then what type? The market is flooded with several. I'm not wanting to spook the deer away and currently I am pouring the feed on the ground, which is only lasting a week or so, causing me to be in the woods way more than I should be. Any suggestions will be greatly appreciated. I really enjoyed the podcast. I am newer to it, but catching up quickly on my drive to and from customers. Thank you. Good luck and God bless Justin Ray. Well, Terry, have at it. I think both will work. I prefer not to pour it on the ground. Um, I like keeping it up out of the mud, out of the snow, out of the rain. 
Um, I like keeping it away from turkeys as everybody who listens to this podcast knows I hate turkeys. I spent, I sent a picture the other day to our buddy Al Foster with, uh, 22 long beards in a picture. And, you know, if I pour, if I pour high protein feed out on the ground, it's very expensive. And all I'm going to do is have 60 turkeys eating on it. Um, so I prefer to get it up, um, just to keep for those reasons, uh, keep it a little bit cleaner and keep it away from the turkeys. Um, as far as what type of feeder, um, you actually, I think I traded something for you. You had a feeder at one time that when Illinois was considering maybe allowing supplemental feeding in the off season, you found one, I believe was Amish build, if I'm not mistaken. And, uh, we traded something for it. I can't remember what it was. And I think it holds about 400, 450 pounds of feed. That's the one that I'm currently using. Uh, it's gravity. I don't like spinner feeders. Um, I don't know what else to say. Um, I did, uh, um, I have used uh, Buck Boss feeders. I, I am trying to get a redneck feeder from um, uh, one of the, actually it's um, one of our real world dealers that carries them, but they were on back order most of the year. I did, uh, I did see a thing that uh, Todd Covey, I mentioned him earlier, he's your consultant client and a friend of mine here in Kentucky to keep coons out of the redneck feeder. He uh, made this six inch PVC adapter that goes on the legs. And since it's six inches around going up the legs and it wobbles, they can't climb the legs to get up into the feeder. So uh, if I can find a picture of that, I'll post it here for the people watching on YouTube. Pretty clever idea, but um, um, I've seen rednecks, buck bosses, and even homemade feeders. Um, I like to try to keep it dry and up off the ground. Hope that helps. You got a lot more experience than I do, but, uh, you know, I have fed on Ohio properties a little bit and I prefer the gravity type feeders that drop it down into a tube, um, just to keep it out of the weather and fresh. I've heard people say that they don't have, you know, mature bucks eating out of their feeder. Um, I would guess that if you take a feeder out two weeks before season and expect to be able to hunt over it, yeah, they're probably not going to eat on it, but outside of when I have to take my feeder and pull it out during Kentucky's turkey season, that feeder stays filled with feed all year round. And I have no issues with the, with any age structure bucks eating out of it. So I've never experienced that on mine, but it's also consistent the entire time. And where I have it, I can get in and out. Of course, they know I'm there, but I think um, um, it's almost to the point that they know I'm there and they know I've fed and I'm leaving something for them when I leave. So I don't know that it's even really intrusion. I don't know if you buy into that or not, but those, those deer pattern me before I pattern them. And when I leave and they know something's there, they're, they're eventually going to figure that out. All right, well, we're going to go ahead and put up our sixth question uh, and get through it, and then we'll circle back on dropping antlers or shedding antlers early. So this one comes from Alex Baines from Columbia, Illinois. He says, hi, Don and Terry. When managing for overall structure of the deer on your property, one, how many bucks in each age class would be preferred? Two, what do you want your buck doe ratio to be? Let's assume for every 100 acres. Another question is very unrelated, but wanted to follow up on it. A few months ago on one of your podcasts, you were talking about trail cameras and said, you know, about something in the works for a new kind of trail camera. Do you by chance remember this? If so, are you able to follow up on this and talk about this new trail cam that everyone is going to love? Um, let, let's start with the trail camera. Um, the individual that uh, had related to me that he was going to design this new trail camera and already had it in the works um, turned out to be a con man. Um, no longer even re replies to my emails, but uh, through a mutual acquaintance, um, I learned that this guy is just basically full of crap. So, uh, that camera that I was promised um, is not going to happen. And all, all kinds of <laughs> shady characters in the hunting world, and this is apparently one of them. Let me jump in here for just a second. Okay. 
This is why we don't talk about anything that we haven't personally used even or take sponsorships on. People, the stuff that everybody, and, and trust me, I get it. I'm not naive enough. They don't care about me. The, the, the stuff that people pitch and want Don to use and talk about with his following, it's insane the amount of stuff that gets thrown his way. And um, this is no different. That's why we are just absolutely sticklers for, you know, and we didn't take the deal from Osseo until we hunted with that camo all year long. We're not going to talk about, we're not going to accept sponsorships. We're not going to do anything because this is a perfect example of the people that just want to ride his coattails, not mine. I'm, I'm, I'm nobody and that's okay. It's, it's just one example after another of when this happened. So let's get on to the other question about age class how many bucks in each age class do you prefer well that's something we have no control over and you know when you start with yearling bucks i want as many yearling bucks on my property as possible um because that's going to mean i have more two-year-olds and that's going to mean i have more when it comes three and it's time to start culling i've got more bucks to choose from and the odds of some of those being larger antlered is, is so much better so just in a nutshell, I want as many bucks as possible. Um, and then when they get to three, you start whittling them down. So you have fewer in each age class. There is no magic number. Um, every property is different. Every area is different surrounding each property. Um, so th there's just no magic number there. And when is we this, to... is this, is this another part where we're guilty of overthinking it too much? You think? It absolutely is. Yeah. And just moving on to the buck doe ratio, it's the same thing. And this question came up in the seminar last night uh, about buck doe ratios. That's something that most land, man I'm talking like 99% of land managers in the United States do not need to worry about buck doe ratios because 99% of us don't have a big enough property that we're going to have any influence whatsoever on a buck to ratio in an area. Um, if your whole neighborhood and I'm talking like almost your whole township is not on board, um, you're going to have a hard time influencing buck to ratio. Um, you can, you can have two or 300 acre property and you can shoot 20 or 30 does. And guess what happens? 40 more come from your neighbors. And, I think as land managers, um, we've been misled to believe that this buck doe ratio thing is so important. And, you know, in a place like Texas where you've got a ranch that's high fenced, yeah, in that situation, managing a buck doe ratio is important. But in a free range herd in most of the country, you, a single landowner is not going to have much impact, if any at all on the buck doe ratio. So most of us just need to forget about that. Now, my personal philosophy on my farm is when the deer herd is healthy, um, which is most of the time, not after an EHD outbreak when the herd has been decimated and you're trying to build it back. But when that herd is healthy, I'm trying to shoot two does for every buck that gets shot on my place. So if we shoot three bucks in a year, I want to shoot six does that year. But strategic and does. That's the exactly. other. Exactly. Yep. Yep. Those ones with the buck fawns. But then when it starts getting down to the last couple of weeks of season, I'll even just start shooting does to, to get a few more wiped out um, just to keep the herd in balance for one thing. But for more, it's even more important in my situation from the habitat standpoint. I don't want so many deer here that they wipe out my food plots I'm trying to grow, that they're putting, you know, extreme browse pressure in the woods and on the woody vegetation. So it's from a habitat standpoint as much as from the deer herd standpoint that I'm trying to control the does. I see a, I see a variance in that philosophy. You know, you're out in open ag fields, so you can take the pressure of a lot more deer especially when the crops are in the field and everything's dispersed over thousands and thousands of acres. Whereas, you know, when you got heavily wooded cover, the conversation I think comes up a lot more, but I heard an analogy not too long ago from some trappers that really get into the science of coyotes. 
And, you know, they, they say that you, you go in and you kill a bunch of coyotes with thermals on a property. Say you let the guys come into your place a couple years ago and they just kill a ton of them. But your problem's not solved there. More coyotes move right in on top of it because it's habitat they want to be in. And it's open, you know, social pressure within that species, you know. Um, so I, I think the same thing really applies to whitetail. You might get short-term benefit of killing a bunch of does to get your doe numbers down, but it's gonna it's gonna even right back out. Yep, no doubt about it. And it's just one of those topics that uh, uh, gets bannered about a little bit on the internet that most of us don't even need to worry about it. Yep. I just keep trying to figure out a way to get more food, more food, more food, more food when, when it happens. So that's where my focus has been. Well, let's finish up the show talking a little bit about this deal with early sheds. And you said that the topic got brought up up in Michigan and you kind of laughed a little bit about it, but then you saw my Facebook post about it and noticed that there were several people commenting about bucks dropping their antlers this year early so i guess let's just start with give us some education of why it could happen what are causes of antlers dropping you know more than a month earlier than normal and then uh talk about what it means maybe well in my experience the only time i've seen bucks shed this early um i'm i mean we're two weeks before Christmas and people are claiming um, these bucks have shed already. The only time I've ever seen it is with an injured deer. If he's injured, um, yeah, they'll shed early. Um, They've got to be stressed somehow or or they're not going to shed early. And when I looked at my captive deer, you know, those captive deer um, always had plenty of food in front of them. And even though we cut the antlers off, they still had the little nubbins, you know, that they would shed each year. And, you know, they just almost never shed early. The only way a buck in the pen ever shed early was if he was injured. Um, I do recall a a situation, I think it was about 2010, somewhere in there. Um, There was a, there was one winter, then we had a really bad ice storm and there was ice on everything and it stayed for like a week or more and i mean it was on the tree branches um soybean stalks yeah out in the soybean plots they were as big around as like a the handle of a shovel with ice and and it didn't melt you know usually if you get that kind of ice a day or two later the sun comes out and it melts this stuff stayed for at least a solid week and that next spring, when I, and actually I didn't even take that long, during that week, those deer laid up in the thickets, and I don't even think they came out to the plots. Um, it was after hunting season, but it was right after. It was towards the end of January. And I remember going in and finding sheds that spring by the arm loads, and, and you go into those thickets, those bedding thickets, and <clears throat> excuse me it was like picking up easter eggs it was just there's one there's one there's one and uh, there's a little five acre thicket that i went in and i carried out eight antlers in that little five acres and i went into another thicket and carried out an arm load it was a bigger thicket and i carried out even more but uh those bucks were stressed they were not eating because even the tree branches the the woody brows it was just covered in ice and for those deer to eat that, I mean, they was having to chew through an inch of ice to get those. And it just, and it was later though, too. I don't think it would have been, had the same impact if that would have happened a month earlier, like at the end of December instead of the end of January. But the timing was right. And I'm telling you, a, a large percentage of the antlers fell during that week that that ice was on the everything. Is it true or do you know... Um the the cycle that happens physiologically with with a with a a buck to drop its antlers is that a drop in testosterone i've heard that before Mm -hmm. is that is that what kind of is the trigger for that that's what i uh, all the research i've ever seen you know claimed that it was the drop in testosterone and it it seems to make sense because uh you know an injured deer is he's not feeding like he normally would and uh, he's he's stressed and 
testosterone levels would drop under those conditions. So if you were going to, if you're going to bet a breakfast steak and shake double cheeseburger that you're famous for dragging me to eat in the mornings, um, if you're going to bet the next steak and shake drive through bill, would you say that there probably isn't any more shedding now than there's ever been? It's just people are able to see what everybody's doing on social media a whole lot more now than before? Wow, that's a tough one. And man, there's a a cheeseburger for breakfast at stake here. Yeah, it's 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 it's, um, it's we're we're high rollers, man. <laughs> it seems like this year I've heard a lot more of it than in past years, and I, I don't know if that's just a coincidence or what. I, I would I would seem to think it's a coincidence because I don't think there's been any event that would lead to more buck shedding early. Now we're getting ready to have some really brutal weather um, later this week. Uh, you know, here Christmas Eve, I think we're supposed to get to have a high of nine degrees during the day, yep. down to zero the night before. And we've got two or three days there in a row where the temperatures are. Man, I'm telling you what, if you're if you got a food source, those deer are going to be all over it. You don't mind and me spending Christmas with you, do? You? <laughs> if you, uh, just bring bring gifts bring gifts and, uh, I, I, I just can't wait to get out there and sit over those soybeans this was a topic that we brought up with dr strickland i believe in the master class but it was the podcast that we do the night before and he talked about the drop in testosterone and you know i i look around the country we we heard about people in ohio and michigan that seen it I would just think that there hasn't been any natural disaster or storm front or anything that's that's been out of the ordinary to put that much stress on them, except for the hunting season. When I, whether those bucks were you know wounded or shot in no man's land or got shot or hit by a car, I don't know. But you sure if it's really tied to the drop in testosterone, we still have some does that might be coming into cycle as they get up to 70, 75 pounds. So I just don't, I don't see the correlation there um, that I think some people are trying to just draw a conclusion, but you never know. Time will tell. Um, if you've seen that, you know, feel free to comment and tell us we're wrong. Um, but it's, it's just definitely something I've been hearing more of lately. And then when I got a picture of that buck that had broken his off, uh, I thought I'm going to have a little bit of fun with this. I'm going to post it on here and see what everybody thinks. And sure enough, everybody says a different, different thing. Yeah. Well, you got to remember just because you see one shed antler or one buck shedding, that doesn't mean that they're shedding early. That buck is probably injured and yeah. that's why he's shedding early. That don't mean the rest of them are going to shed early, but, uh, yeah, a weather can be a big factor, like I described with the ice storm earlier. So, hey, who knows what is going to happen in the next month or so? Yep. So, for those people who have late season tags, I wouldn't get too discouraged if you see that a couple bucks have shed. I think you still got time, right? Oh, no doubt about it. Yep. All right. Well, um, I think it's it's a topic that's come up this week. We wanted to touch on it and obviously discuss it and give Don's opinions of it. So, uh, hope that helps. What else you want to talk about before, I guess, uh, the next time we come at everybody, it's going to be Christmas day. I don't know. We got to talk about how we're going to release that one and record it. We might have to record a couple of days earlier and release on Christmas. Um, cause I don't know that we'll be spending time with our families. So, right. Well, I'm hoping to get out in the, in the woods and, and do some hunting this week. I've only got one consulting visit this week, so I ought to definitely have some time in the woods. Uh, I didn't mention that since our last podcast we recorded, I got to, to hunt. It would uh, be a week, a week ago uh, tomorrow and uh, got some fantastic video footage of a nice buck. And I, I've got some of the best video footage this fall that I've gotten since Smokey, uh, w which would have been back in uh, 20, well, 2017. Mm -hmm. Actually, the, the best footage I got of Smokey was the year before when I passed him as a five-year-old, which would have been 2016. But uh, if things, you know, fall into place and some of these bucks make it another couple of years, um, I've got some fantastic footage to show in the future. 
The future is looking bright. Yep, for sure. Well, the only other thing I want to talk about before we get done is uh, tomorrow I'll be married 23 years to my wife. Awesome. So total that is 27 hunting seasons she's put up with me since we've been together. So uh, She's a saint. She is definitely a saint to put up with me. And uh, we couldn't, and I know every hunter out there... Um, feels the same way if there's more their significant other did not uh put up with what they do it would be a lot tougher but i'm i'm telling you my wife has never complained one time to me about uh this passion that i have and the enjoyment that i get out of hunting and i'm i'm extremely blessed to have somebody that doesn't uh poke at me all the time about this thing well congratulations to you and your wife terry and uh, just to add to that a little bit i'll I'm telling you, the most successful people that I know have a very supportive spouse. And I know that I couldn't have done what I've done without my wife supporting me along the way as well. So, uh, young guys, before you get married, before you say I do, make sure it's the right one. Because if she's nagging and nitpicking all the time, it's going to affect you in many, many ways. And, uh, hold you back from being all that you can be so choose wisely yep all right everybody we appreciate it we'll be back around uh talking to you again around christmas day but thanks for your support we really appreciate it god bless everyone have a great week chasing giants has been brought to you by osseo camo by a farm real estate company 360 hunting blinds victory chevrolet real world wildlife products Matthews Archery, Novix Tree Stands, Gingerich Tree Farm, WildlifeFarming.com, Quiet Cat, and Vortex Optics. Thanks for listening and tune in next week for another episode of Chasing Giants.